warm welcome to you in our Lagos studio. I'm Millicent Umoka. We begin with the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Ukrainian military is saying that it launched a long-awaited counteroffensive to take back territory from Russian forces in its south, bolstered by weaponry supplied by the West. Moscow acknowledged the offensive by Ukraine near the city of Kherson, but also said it had failed and that Ukrainians had suffered significant casualties. Meanwhile, Russian shells bombarded the southern port city of Mykolaiv. The city's mayor said homes had been hit and at least two people killed. This latest Ukrainian offensive comes after weeks of bloody stalemates in the war. The conflict broke out when Russian troops poured over Ukraine's borders in February in what Russia calls a special military operation to rid Ukraine of nationalists and protect Russian-speaking communities. Ukraine calls it an unprovoked war of aggression. Thousands have been killed, millions displaced, and the scale of fighting is larger than anything in Europe since World War II. Russia captured with, uh, much of the South early on. And now Ukraine's using sophisticated Western-supplied weapons to hit Russian ammunition dumps and wreak havoc with supply lines. A spokesperson for Ukraine's Southern Command declined to give details of the counteroffensive, saying Russian forces in Southern Ukraine remained quite powerful. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has been speaking during his late night address said that the newly instituted Memorial Day was to remind the world about Ukrainian losses from the 2014 battle of Ilovyask onwards. President Zelensky added that Ukrainian troops will chase the Russian army to the border. This Memorial Day is set for the end of summer, August 29, to remind everyone of the tragic event of 2014 about Lovesk. That is war, which began with the occupation of our Crimea with attempt to seize Donbass, should end in that very place. In the liberated Crimea, in the liberated cities of Donbas, with our troops reaching the state's border of Ukraine, we have always kept this goal in mind. We have never forgotten it. The armed forces of Ukraine, our intelligence, and our defense forces are doing their jobs. I'm sure you all understand what's going on, what we are fighting for, and what we are striving for. And our warriors do not need any announcement or information waves behind them. Ukraine is taking back its own. Meanwhile, the Kremlin has said that it hoped a planned visit to the Zaporizhia nuclear plant by the International Atomic Energy Agency goes ahead and that the visit is in Russia's interest. In a call with reporters, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said Moscow hoped the visit would take place as agreed. He said, we have an interest in this mission and have been waiting for it for a long time. Mr. Peskov accused Ukrainian military of continuous shelling of the Zaporizhia nuclear plant plant and called European countries and the UK to use their influence on Kyiv to forbid it to carry on with these actions. Well, staying with the Kremlin, Moscow slammed calls by some European leaders for a visa ban on Russian tourists, saying the proposals were irrational and the latest manifestation of the West's anti-Russian agenda. At a meeting in Prague this week, European Union foreign ministers will discuss calls from the Baltic states and some others to stop granting Russians visas for access to the EU's 26th nation free movement Schengen zone. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov told reporters, quote, step by step, unfortunately, both Brussels and individual European capitals are demonstrating an absolute lack of reason. He said Europe's actions towards Russia were bordering on insanity, making it possible Brussels could push ahead with a ban in the future. He says without saying what Russia might or how Russia might respond, Eastern and Nordic EU member states have argued strongly for an outright ban on tourist visas for Russians in response to Moscow's actions in Ukraine, saying travel to Europe is a privilege, not a right. But EU heavyweights, France and Germany, are against the proposals to restrict visas to Russians, saying such a step would be counterproductive.
Who is Anna Janikova, joins me now from Kyiv. Hi, Anna, it's good to see you. Let's begin with uh, Russia's defense ministry saying that Russian forces shot down a Ukrainian drone that was trying to attack the Zaporizhia reactor complex. Uh, it also said other officials, uh, you know, said the Ukrainian missile hit a fuel depot um, at the plant. So it's like all the blames going to Ukraine. Um, can you confirm this? Good evening. Uh, well, no, I cannot confirm that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we hear a lot of um, um, a lot of acquisitions from the Russian side uh, uh, to the U U Ukrainian forces, uh, especially around the Parisian power plant, and especially uh, at this point of time when uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency mission is coming. So it looks uh, pretty much. Um, you know, uh, it, it looks a little bit, you know, um, weird in terms of, you know, this announcement and mission come at the same time. Uh, at least uh, if we look at the international uh, intelligence reports and military experts and according to Ukrainian officials, um, uh, no one did confirm, neither confirm nor uh, presented this information. So this information comes only from the Russian side and it's difficult to confirm it. Uh, at least uh, we should definitely look at the international reports and uh, none of the international reports had this uh, in place. Uh, uh, even more, uh, we hear a lot that uh, international community, uh, both political community and military community, encourage Russian forces to uh, demilitarize this territory and stop fighting around this territory. So um, we cannot, uh, for the moment, uh, we don't have any confirmation of uh, any attacks by Ukrainian forces uh, on the, the Parisian power plant. And Ukraine is uh, waiting very much for the uh, International uh, Atomic Ad uh, Agency, uh, Energy Agency to come and to check the state of the, of the, of the plant and the state uh, of the territory around it. Indeed, even the White House said that Russia should agree to a demilitarized zone around the plant. But a lot of people wonder about, you know, the situation there because we're hearing of um, iodine tablets, potassium uh, tablets for residents living in that vicinity. We also hear that people who are fleeing other areas um, are actually landing, coming uh, to Zaporizhia, saying that they fear uh, those strikes rather than the possible potential, um, you know, disaster that could occur with the shelling around Zaporizhia's nuclear plant? Uh, well, um, we should, you know, look at this geographically because unfortunately Zaporizhia is right in this place that people who flee occupied territories in the south, uh, it's the only way they go through. So the Parisia is the point they go through. Some people remain there. Some people continue their journey. But uh, this is basically the, the main point uh, of, uh, let's say, of meeting uh, for these people. Uh, so um, uh, coming back to your question uh, in terms of the danger, it is danger and people are, uh, and the government, uh, local government, uh, provide people with additional uh, UD ta uh, tablets uh, to, in case uh, any leaks uh, are happening. Uh, again, for the moment, uh, we hear the reports and we follow the reports of the Enerho Atom representatives uh, who, um, who remind and, you know, uh, keep up to date the, the population of Ukraine and population of these territories uh, which are close to the uh, nuclear power plant in the, the British nuclear power plant. Uh, so for the moment, there were no uh, reports or no um, you know, information for any evacuation, meaning that uh, for the moment there is no, uh, you know, real um, uh, risk of something happening right now or right in the very nearest future. Of course, it could happen. The risk is still there because uh, fightings are happening around. But still, uh, people are, uh, you know, uh, having this under certain, you know, up-to-date control. Uh, and uh, for the moment, no evacuation was, uh, was uh, you know, uh, so it is possible to evacuate, but no evacuation, uh, which is absolutely must for the 
people from these areas. Uh, but we should understand that there is always danger and risks, and people are also informed about that. So uh, in case people uh, take this decision to leave, uh, it's absolutely uh, fine. But uh, evacuation by the government will be done uh, only in case uh, some real uh, leaks uh, started or you know starting to happen. Mm, and also, Anna, Russia said this yesterday, it's almost as if they are confident, and so did a top Russian diplomat saying that Moscow hoped that a visit by the International Atomic Energy Agency um, to the Russian controlled Zaporizhia uh, station would dispel misconceptions about its allegedly poor state. Um, what does Ukraine think? Ukraine... Uh definitely is very interested for the mission to start. Ukraine wants uh, clear and uh, fair analysis of the situation uh, because Ukraine um, Ukrainian officials and Energo Atom, uh, they have certain, in, uh, they have more, of course, details uh, on the real state of the of the power plant, and they have, uh, you know, enough details and enough information to be actually very worried about the state of the of the power plant. Uh, so it is important that it is. Um, either confirmed and actions are taken because the main action here would be would be immediate demilitarization of the zone uh, or um, at least that the mission would uh, check uh, and say that uh, the state of the of the plant is okay but again uh, from from what we hear from the chief of the agency and also from the international uh, community of the experts and Ukrainian experts that uh, anyway, the state in which the Parisian power plant is uh, operating at the moment is not a normal situation. And it's very dangerous because we should consider that this is the biggest uh, in Europe atomic um, energy state uh, plant. And uh, it's definitely not okay that it is a part of the military activity. So Ukraine hopes, uh, and this is uh, probably would be the main uh, aim for the mission, uh, to demilitarize this area and to make sure that the power plant uh, is operating in safe conditions, in normal conditions. Uh, and, uh, well, hopefully it will be under, um, under the control of the experts. And Anna, let's talk on the back of uh, Memorial Day. We heard from uh, President Zelensky, um, you know, and also this is the fighting uh, Ukrainian troops mounting counteroffensive, um, saying that they've broken through Russian defenses, uh, several sectors uh, near the city of Kherson. Uh, but then the Russians are saying that that is not true. We have confirmation from uh, from the Ukrainian military officials and also from uh, some uh, reports from the international media, which um, uh, which get information from international, uh, also uh, experts, uh, sometimes anonymously, sometimes not. But um, the main uh, idea is that uh, the confirmed information for the moment is that Ukrainian forces are actually. Uh, actually made it through the first line of defense of the Russian forces in Kherson region. Uh, so this was an official report from the general staff of Ukraine and also confirmed by a couple of, uh, again, as I already said, international sources. Uh, and this is also something uh, reported by the locals uh, who are located in Kherson and in Kherson region, because, of course, this also this information is coming from the inside of these territories. Uh, we don't have a lot of details for the moment because Ukrainian officials um, they uh, they confirm that the action is going on uh, the counteroffensive uh, actions are going on but uh, no details would be provided uh, until the operation is done and until there are actual results because for the moment everything is ongoing and it's very um, it's very dangerous to reveal any you know details on this uh, on these particular uh, actions but uh, we also have confirmation that Ukrainian forces managed to liberate a couple of villages uh, and uh, we have also reports uh, from the 
from the inside of Kherson and the region that there are a lot of explosions heard in Kherson and uh, around Kherson. Uh, a lot of the Russian bases were hit in the past days. Uh, and also today, uh, Ukrainian forces uh, destroyed one of the crosses over Dnipro, uh, over Dnipro River, uh, this temporary crosses that Russian forces um, built uh, to be able to move over the river. Uh, Due to these actions, uh, again, this, was, uh, this is what we have as a confirmed information from the general staff. Uh, more than 80 uh, Russian uh, military, um, uh, Russian soldiers were killed and uh, around 30 pieces of equipment, of military equipment was destroyed, but uh, were destroyed. But again, um, uh, we don't have, you know, very much details on that. So what we only hear, and this is also what was said by the uh, by the U.S. representatives, that there is definitely uh, an activity going on in there, and uh, we can uh, we can say for the moment that this is counteroffensive actions which are happening, and there are certain advances um, being reported by the um, by the Ukrainian forces. But this is what we know for the moment, and more details might come when first results are in place. And I would like to thank you. We appreciate um, you joining us today. Continue to stay safe. Thank you. And the United Nations chartered ship loaded with Ukrainian wheat destined for millions at risk of starvation in Ethiopia has arrived in Djibouti. This is according to the World Food Programme. The bulk carrier MV Brave Commander, which is carrying 23,000 tons of grain, docked in the Horn of Africa port city today, two weeks after leaving a black sea port in Ukraine. The WFP executive director, David Beasley, said on Twitter, we have officially docked the first WFP UFP ship to carry Ukrainian grain since February has just arrived in Djibouti. Now let's get this wheat offloaded and on to Ethiopia. The UN agency said food insecurity and malnutrition are a major concern across Ethiopia, with an estimated 20.4 million people in need of food support. Ukraine, one of the world's largest grain exporters, was forced to halt almost all deliveries after Russia invaded the country, raising fears of a global food crisis. Exports of grains and other foodstuffs and fertilizers from three black seaports resumed at the start of this month under a deal between Kyiv and Moscow that was brokered by the UN and Turkey in July. Elsewhere, European Union defense ministers at a meeting in Prague have set to pave the way for the establishment of an EU training mission for Ukrainian forces. This is according to the bloc's top diplomat, Josep Borrell. He told reporters as he arrived for talks in Prague that the situation on ground continues to be very bad. This nuclear gambling in the nuclear power station Zaporizhia is something very dangerous. So the situation in the ground continues being very bad. Ukraine needs our support, and we will continue providing this support. The ministers will discuss about the idea of uh, putting in place a high-level training mission for the Ukrainian army. A general and overall political agreement. That's what I think we have to get today. Later, the details will come. We have a procedure quite complex in order to identify the objective, the purpose, the dimension, the resources. But today, I, I hope that we will have a, a green light, a political green light for this mission. Several member states will have different ideas. But this idea of a training mission, it's an old idea. We have been discussing that even before the war started. So member state put this idea on the table. So that's the moment to act. That's the moment to take decisions.